All right, we've had our prayer. This, we're going to be in Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 3. And if uh, the lesson, uh, exploring the Bible, literature, we'll leave out chapter 2 so they don't deal with that at all. Of course, I can't do that. So I'm gonna, we're going to look at chapter 2 and then we'll look at chapter 3. The lesson Sunday is about the Hebrew children that were thrown into the fiery furnace. So that's really easy because it's narrative it's not a lot of doctrine in it or nothing else except you know they were being faithful to god and god was being faithful to them but it does represent a lot of things for one thing if i don't get to it it represents the fact that in the tribulation god is going to protect his people whether they come through the fire or come through the flood you know he's going to protect them and provide for them and so that you're going to see a lot of things in Daniel that point to that the latter days so as we get into this uh, you see on the board I, I have the statue that's this is Nebuchadnezzar's dream Nebuchadnezzar Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and it's in chapter 2 and of course there's a lot of verses there we're not going to look at all of them I'm just going to talk about it he had, this is the dream he had. He had a visions of a statue, a, a person, a, an image. And it, it was gold and silver and bronze and iron, iron and clay. That's what he saw. And so we're going to kind of look at that. In the introduction on the handout I gave you, this is the simplest prophetic picture presented in Scripture. Why would we overlook it? This is the simplest one. You know, you can't hardly miss this. You really have to work at it if you miss this. Because you look at the commentaries, everybody says that, you know, that this, the gold represents Babylon, silver, Persia, Media, then the Greeks, and then the Romans. That fell out. That's the history of, of world, world history. And so, and I could say this, that the Bible is not interested in giving you a complete world history. It gives you information as pertaining to these great empires and how they related to Israel, how they're affecting Israel, because that's the point. And it's how it's going to fall out upon Israel itself. And so it's, this, is called, this is called the times of the Gentiles. Every bit of this from the top up here, the top of this man's head or image head, to the clay feet down here. You've heard the phrase, expression, Clay feet, this is where it comes from, clay feet. All of this is the times of the Gentiles, every bit of it. And, uh, and so all of this was seen by prophecy. Prophecy saw times of the Gentiles right here. We say, where did that come from? Now, last time I gave you a, a quite a bit on the times of the Gentiles on that handout. But look at uh, in the introduction here, I quote Jesus. Uh, Luke chapter 21, verse 24, Jesus speaks of the future events, including the destruction of Jerusalem and his return. And here's what he says. Quote, this is quoting Jesus in the, e, the e, ESV translation. Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. In other words, does that sound like that God has a plan and when it's fulfilled, then that's going to be the end of Gentile nations trampling on Israel because the rock is released against those that image. Remember in the dream, we'll see it in a moment. The rock, here's the rock. The rock is released against this image and the whole thing is destroyed. And that is when you have the kingdom of God on the earth being presented for the second advent of Jesus. He's the rock. When he comes, he's going to defeat the Gentile nations that are coming up against Jerusalem at that time. So uh, I, I quoted Ironside in the next part here about the present age and about the Gentile, uh, the times of the Gentile. Look at that little, it's in italics. It says, during the present age, now the present age is right here. This is the church age right here. This is the present age. We're living right here. And see, prophecy never talks about our time. 
And so when we talk about the times of the Gentiles being complete, you've got to realize that completion doesn't come in any time in the last 2,000 years. It comes right here. Because there's seven more years determined upon Israel and the times of the Gentiles. Seven more years. We'll learn that later on in Daniel. Because we learn that from Daniel. And also that's reinforced in the book of Revelation. The Revelation talks about the seven years tribulation. Jesus talked about the tribulation, the great tribulation in Matthew 24. And Revelation it divides it up into three and a half, three and a half. And Daniel divides it up three and a half and three and a half. And if you miss that, it even spells it out in days. You have to work hard about, you know, to miss it, see, if you're paying attention. And so notice this. He says, during the present age, that's our time, while it is true that the Gentile times are still running on, prophecy itself, now prophecy has to do not with this church age, but with a period that closed at the cross when Christ was cut off and another brief season, the seven-year season, which will commence after the church has been caught up to be with the Lord. That's the rapture. He believed in the rapture. I'm sorry I did. And all the other people that I'm quoting, like J. Vernon McGee and Dwight Pentecost, who was a professor at Dallas, uh, you know, just on and on. And so... I, you know, we, we're presenting it like that. Now, in the outline of chapter 2, you have three things, real quick. You have Nebuchadnezzar's dream. We won't have to go there. I might mention something about it in a moment. But we go to the interpretation of the dream because he just repeats it again. And so when Daniel comes in, he repeats, you know, he's going to interpret it for them because the king is upset. He had a dream, right? And he forgot the dream. He, he can't remember the dream. But he was really upset about the dream. It stirred him. It upset him. And so he brings in all his magicians and all of his wise men and the astrologers and the soothsayers and the mediums. These are all part of that called the, the magicians or Chaldeans even. They call them Chaldeans. Although all the Babylonians were Chaldeans, but that's how it's referred to. He brings them in and says, tell me the dream and give me the interpretation. They say, well, Give us the dream and we'll interpret it for you. I can interpret stuff if you give me your dream. You know, Sigmund Freud could interpret your dreams if you told him what the dreams were. You know, it might not have been right, but how would you, how would you figure it out, you know? So this old man's not too, he's not dumb. Nebuchadnezzar didn't get there because, you know, he was dumb and lazy. He was, uh, he was, the, he was the highest authority in the world. And he was smart. But he was very arrogant and proud. And, uh, but he'll lose that before it's over with. And there's going to be steps in that. I want you to look for the steps. As he goes along, he's beginning to learn about who God is. And after he eats grass for a while, he learns who the God of heaven is and he's over all things. And so we'll kind of follow that in your lessons as you go through. But you have the dream and so on. And then, they, then Daniel gets promoted to the, one of the highest positions in the kingdom after he interprets the dream for the, for the, uh, for the emperor or the, the king. One of the things, yeah, I wanted to show you in chapter 2, if you have your Bibles, if you don't, just listen. In chapter 2, uh, verse 28 and 29, Daniel uh, says, it says in 28, I'll just read it, uh, it says, however, there is a God in heaven, Daniel's telling him, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. And I have the New American Standard, but in the latter days. So what we're talking about, that, there's no question about it. We're talking about what's going to happen in the latter days. Ultimately, you know, these kingdoms are going to come and go, but the main part of Daniel is what's happening in the latter days, right here. The last part of the times of the Gentiles, right here. This is the tribulation. That's the latter days on the earth. Now, there is a difference. Here. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, Paul talks about the latter days of the church age. The latter days of the church age. Peter talks about the latter days right here. When Peter talks about the latter days, he's talking about this right here, the day of the Lord. 
When Paul talks about the latter days, he's talking about the latter days of the church before we get raptured. That makes sense, don't it? In the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves. Remember that. All right, so, and then let me read one more verse over here. So he says, this is going to be what takes place in the latter days. And then he says this, this is your dream. Now he's telling you, he's interpreting for it. And here's this king who has the power to snap your life out like that. He had already told him, he said, if you don't tell me your, my dream, all of you are going to die. I'm going to burn your houses up. Take care of your family. And he meant it too. And so here's what he says. This was your dream. He's about to give it to us. And the visions in your mind while you were on your bed. As for you, O king, get this. As for you, O king, while on your bed, your thoughts turn to what would take place in the future. His mind, this king was actually ruminating over what the future was going to be. You know, wouldn't that be good if every Baptist had a rumination on their bed every night about what the future is going to be? And you want to have an interest in the latter days? Wouldn't that be good? You know, we're, people are afraid of that because there's been so many fanatics. And there has been fanatics. Terrible people come up with all kinds of, you know, kind of fanatical things about the end of time. It's supposed to have happened, you know, a long time ago. People set dates and all that. But this man wanted to know what was going to happen in the latter days. That's what Daniel says. It's on your, on your bed you had thoughts about the future. And here's what he said to him further in verse 29. And he says that he, meaning God, he who reveals mysteries has made known to you what will take place. All right? And, and, and mainly, what, what can I take out of that little statement? God wanted him to know the truth. God wanted Nebuchadnezzar to know the truth, or he wouldn't have given it to him. He wanted him to know it. He wants you to know it. He wants me to know it. Because he's, already, he's revealed it to us. All right, so there it is. So look at the uh, interpretation now. Let's go into the interpretation of the dream. And I am trying to get move on so I can uh, get to that part about uh, chapter 3 when we get to it, if we can. But I'm going to go down these points, really brief. Uh, no, I, I numbered them there. I got them numbered. So number one, Daniel carefully distinguished the dream in verse 31 through 35 from the interpretation of the dream, which is verses 36 through 45. For the sake of clarity, it's so clear. He just lays it out there for us. Like I say, if you just read it, you get it. And, and again, I want to say one more time. Chapter 2, this image, is the clearest presentation, picture of history and prophecy that's found anywhere else in the Bible. It's just so clear. If you get to chapter 7, it gets more complicated, but it's really clear at the beginning. So a good teacher would do what? You present it like here, you get the whole big picture like this right here, that's easy. And then later you get the details. And that's when we get down to the toes, <laughs> the 10 toes, which are 10 kings or kingdoms. And then the one, the little horn that puts down the three and takes over, that's the antichrist. The little horn is the antichrist, the son of perdition. All right, so let's go. Number two, the future kingdoms were, here it is, Persia, Media Persia, the Greeks, and the Romans. Uh, so the present kingdom was Babylon. And so when he interprets that for him, he says to Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head, the golden head. You're the head. And then notice all, all the commentaries start telling about the, uh, uh, the uh, specific gravity of each one of the metals. <laughs> if you've ever read it, they all do that. I could have given that to you, but I didn't care about that. But this is the heaviest metal, and this is the next heaviest, and it goes down to, you know, iron and clay. Clay is not very much compared to gold as far as the weight of it. And the point is, Nebuchadnezzar was an absolute despot. He was an absolute dictator. He had no one to answer to, no one, except the God of heaven, which he's going to find out. 
that there's someone over him. But all the rest of them will have limited power. All the way down even to the Romans, they had limited power. Everybody else had limited power. For instance, the Persians, uh, their kingdom was based on law. You know, not, not on the leader, but on law. And so you'll have that. All right, so, so uh, the kingdom, that's the kingdoms. And then uh, number three, I talked about the Romans uh, defeating the Greeks and how long they remained the uh, kingdom. Roman Empire lasted a long time. You had the eastern, the western, and the, they broke into the eastern uh, and the western branches of the Roman Empire. So you get this right here. You, you get two branches of it. And then, but keep in mind that what happened, there is a time when you could say Rome fell. Rome was never conquered. Rome just fell. All right, so the point is, your, your Bible teachers are going to say that, yeah, this is Rome, but these down here, these feet, have to do with what, you know, J. Vernon McGee calls, uh, no, he doesn't call it revised. Some of, the, some of the commentaries call it revised Roman Empire. You know, that's what I always heard too, the revised Roman Empire. In other words, at the end of time, the latter days, during the tribulation, there will come together a 10 nation confederacy under one leader. That leader will be the Antichrist. And uh, that would be something like the revised Roman Empire. Uh, J. Vernon McGee says the Roman uh, Empire never ended. It still exists today. And he says it's just like Humpty Dumpty. He said all the pieces are there, just nobody's been able to put it back together. Uh, I'm getting ahead, but let's read it on, pa on page two. And here's what Ronald McGee said about it. I thought it's good. So when he, he says something about Humpty Dumpty, I, I said, wow, that's, uh, that's him. He says, this is number nine. He says, I never speak of the resurrection of the Roman Empire. In other words, the revised Roman Empire. He says, that implies that it is dead that it died. He says, you see, the Roman Empire fell apart like Humpty Dumpty. There has been a lot of men who tried to put it together again, but they have not succeeded. That was one of the missions of the, Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church at the beginning. Also, Charlemagne attempted to put it back together. Napoleon tried to do it, and also several emperors of Germany Hitler and Mussolini attempted it. But so far, notice that, but so far the man that has not yet appeared who will accomplish it, God is not quite ready for him to appear. And so when God gets ready for him to appear, he will appear and he will be able to put the pieces back together again. Now if we go down... Go back to your front page, and all that will come into view just in a moment. Uh, go back to number four. Nebuchadnezzar was an absolute monarch, and those rulers who followed him, the Persians, the Greeks, the Roman sovereigns, were increasingly less powerful personally. Okay, that's true. All the way down, you absolute right here, going all the way down. Because clay is like a democracy. Iron is like a dictatorship, but you got iron and clay mixed together, which is not, they don't cohere very well, but they're together. All right, and then uh, number five. This is, try to get this now, the final form of the fourth kingdom. Now, this is the fourth kingdom right here. You got one, two, three, four. The fourth kingdom is Rome. But the final, look at that, the final form of it, that's going to be the feet and the toes. That's the final form. Uh, the final form of the fourth kingdom, Daniel did not identify it as the fifth kingdom, but he kept it as the fourth, but a final form of it would not have the cohesiveness that the earlier kingdoms possess. The Roman Empire never consisted of a combination of imperial rule and democracy at the same time, even though the people had an increasing voice in government as time went by. It remained imperialistic to its very end. Number six, the way that many scholars have dealt with this problem, in other words, the, 
viewing this and then this. These are two different things, but we keep it as one. So there's, a, there's an early stage where this was fulfilled. This was the empire that put Jesus on the cross. But there's a part of that that's not through. It's, there's another part of that that's going to challenge uh, the people of God before Jesus comes again. He came the first time, they cut him off. He's coming again, and they're there, there to prevent him from coming, to destroy his people. And so it's going to be very interesting. So keep that in mind. We're talking about the final form, okay? And so number six, the way that many scholars have dealt with this problem is to view the last stage of the Roman Empire in this vision as still future. Right now, still future to us. Uh, some scholars believe that the Roman Empire will be revived in the last days. They believe that it ended and that it will somehow come back into existence in the future. There's some people believe that. And number seven, there's another view. Another view is that the Roman Empire exists today anyway. It exists right now, though not in the same form. Look at that. It's not the same form in which it existed in ancient times. And it will continue to exist until it attains its ten toe stage. The ten toes. So that's future, the ten toes. Now that's the position of Constable and also J. Vernon McGee and others. The Roman Empire, number eight, the Roman Empire is the last and it will be in existence in the latter days. Actually, it exists today. All of those other empires were destroyed by an enemy from the outside, but no enemy destroyed Rome. Attila, Attila the, the Hun came in and sacked the city of Rome, but he was so awestruck by what he saw that he realized he could not handle it. He took his barbarians and they left town. The Roman Empire fell apart from within. No enemy destroyed it. Now look at this statement. Rome is living... Rome is living in the great nations of Europe today. What would that be? Italy, France, Great Britain, Germany, and Spain are all part of the old Roman Empire. The laws of Rome live on, and the, her language also. No one speaks Latin today, but it is the basic, it's basic to the understanding of French, Spanish, and other languages. Her warlike spirit lives on also. Europe has been in war ever since forever. You know, the French and the English, yeah, all these times. And of course, think of World War I and II, and who started that? The Germanic peoples. They, they're fighting. They're fighters. They want to destroy each other. And, uh, and, and, you know, and again, the attempt of Mussolini or Hitler or others, uh, all these people tried to pull it all back together, and they couldn't do it. One world empire again, like Rome. One world empire. And so ever since the empire broke up in these kingdoms, they've been at war. These same people, they're the Romans. All right, so you see now what J. Vernon McGee was talking about on the second page, uh, how he sees that one day all these parts, these countries that we talk about, one day they'll come together. Now, a lot of people, you know, when they made the European Union, you know, it was eight, eight nations or ten nations, a lot of people say, oh, this is it. But uh, that's not it yet. It can't be because we're here. But that you can see pictures of it. You see how it's happening and how it could happen because you've got to have a world government, a world, cur world, a world currency, you know, economic system, uh, banking, you know, all this stuff, the international corporations are going to pull together a lot of power. Uh, and, and so on. One world religion. It has to be a one world religion. Now, there is another view, and, and I didn't put it in the notes, but there is another view, and it, it makes sense too, that, the, that, that, that down at the end, it doesn't make sense that it's wrong, but down at the end, like the little horn or these people coming against the Jews, are going to be Muslims. You know, the, the caliphate, the caliphate and the Muslim world, if it continues to be what it is. But whatever it is, the man of sin is going to have to negotiate something with the Muslims. 
There's no question, because they're going to resist everything. And so there has to be some kind of negotiation. And we know there's a treaty at the very beginning. Here's the treaty. It starts right here. As soon as the church is gone in the rapture, uh, this is the rapture, we go. And then beginning of that seven years, the Antichrist appears. He's manifested. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul talks about it. And then when, once he's manifested, he makes a treaty with the Jews. And probably just with the whole world, the economic system, to uh, bring about, pull everybody together. And, uh, you know, nobody, it's like, like J. Vernon McGee says, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put old Humpty back together again until the one man comes that can do that. Who can do that? You know, you know we can't find somebody to run our country, much less run the world. <laughs> so there it is. So no, look at number 10. According to Daniel's prophecy, the two-toe ship stage, that's your ten, ten nation, the two-toed, the ten toe, excuse me, not two toe. The ten toe, toe stage, is synonymous, which means you got to have these ten nations all at one time, coexisting together. Uh, it can't be something like one follows another. They will all be there. The kingdoms exist side by side. They have to be. There's going to be ten great kingdoms side by side, and they were destroyed by one sudden catastrophic blow. Nothing like this yet has occurred in history. That's Dr. Wilbert, who's the president of Dallas Seminary at one time. Now, so in other words, he says, nothing in history matches this. So we know it's the latter time. Ten great empires will exist, and they'll come together under a confederacy, and they'll be knocked out suddenly. And that's what the interpretation of the dream is. What does he say at the end of the dream? He says there's a rock that's hewn out without hands, which means man had nothing to do with it. If you've got a rock hewn out without hands, man had nothing to do with it. And, it, and we know that rock is Jesus. And so that rock comes. Here it is, right here. The rock comes, right here. And that's when the, those nations get smashed. He's going, to, he's going to defeat them. And, and, and we don't just see that in Daniel. You know, when I taught it, Zechariah, if you read little Zechariah, you'll see every bit of it. Every bit of it just jump off the page at you. If you read the book of Revelation, it jump off the page at you. So all these things, you know, the kingdoms of this world, one day, is going down. You know, and then the Lord, when the Lord comes at the second advent. Uh, so it's interesting. So let me read the rest of that then on number 11. Let me look at number 11. Verse 41, which is, uh, let, me deal, let me get that verse 41 for you. Oops, there it is. He says, in that you see the feet and the toes. All right, that's the part we're going to focus on now. Because he's going to emphasize that in chapter 7. So he says, in that you see the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom. But it will have in it the toughness of iron inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with the common clay. And then he says the toes are the feet, and he talks about that, how they're brittle and so on. And he goes on down uh, Look at verse 44 now. In the days of those kings, those ten now, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. Right here. There's the kingdom. It's going to be when the completion of the times of the Gentiles is through. Remember what Gentiles, the times of Gentiles means that Gentile nations are controlling the things over the people of God. You know, they're, they're, they're controlling... And 605 is the first time when Babylon took over the land of Israel. And so the, gen the times of the Gentiles is when, like Jesus said, when the Gentiles trample the Jews, when they're subdued, put down. All right? And so, and then you don't have a king on the throne of David. 
That's another uh, definition of the times of the Gentiles. But in verse 40, 44, it says, In those days, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. Now, look at that, never. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw, he's talking to Nebuchadnezzar, inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. You know, Daniel is telling the king that the interpretation is true, the dream is true. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. All right. Do I think the dream is true? Absolutely. You think I believe that Daniel interpreted it correctly? I certainly do. And we got all these kind of views about things, but look, what's the, what's the, final, what's the bottom line? Christ is coming, and he's going to defeat the enemies of God in the time of the tribulation that time that Jesus spoke of. All right, now, all right, I read that. Let's read the rest of this on number 11. The ten toes make up the iron and the earthenware, where a fragile base for the huge monument. The text clearly implies that this final phase will be marked by some sort of federation, all right, rather than by a powerful single realm. The iron may possibly represent, notice that word possibly, when people use that, you know, we're not trying to be dogmatic. It may possibly represent uh, the influence of the old Roman culture and tradition, and the pottery may represent the inherent weakness in a socialistic society based on relativism in morality and philosophy. The iron and the pottery may coexist, but they cannot combine into a strong, durable world order. So it's, it's, not, it's, not what, it's not what the goal is. Then number 12, Daniel chapter 2 emphasizes Rome in its, last, in its past two stages, the legs. But in chapter 7, it reveals more about Rome in its future tenfold form, the toast, the ten nations, see? So we know that there was a Roman Empire that cut Jesus off at the cross right here. But we don't hear it at the Roman Empire. And then this fizzled down, but you still got the territory of Rome. And you still got the broken up countries that made up Rome. And if they come together, somebody puts this together. And like I said, I've, I've rounded it off to you. You know, Hitler tried to put it together. He's just one person. What, was he against the Jews? Oh, yeah. Wait till this stuff gets together and the Jews are going to be annihilated. They're going to, they're going to seek to annihilate Israel. Why? It's got to be some, something about that, huh? They might be the people of God. Uh, not now. It's different. We're the body of Christ. But once the body of Christ is removed, God will deal with the Jew again. It's called Jacob's trouble. You've heard of that. Jacob's trouble. Seven years is still determined on Jacob, meaning Israel. And they've got to go through a lot. They're going to be struggling through that. They're going to be judged also with the world. And a lot of people are going to die. And Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. There's going to be a lot of bloodshed. And when they get ready to call on Jesus, that's when he comes. You know when the Lord's going to come? When, when the people of God, at that time, they'll be the Jews. When they recognized that they that who their Messiah is, and that they had that they had crucified him, and then Zechariah says they'll call on him whom they pierced, and and when they call on him, that's when he comes. The book of Zechariah is so clear. All this is real clear to me. Anyway, that's a lot of things. I don't understand everything, but I understand the big things. You know, I understand the big things. I remember the first time I read the book of Revelation. I was in the ninth grade in, in, uh, in high school, 
And this old boy behind me poked me one day and said, you know, there's, there's dragons in the Bible. And I said, oh, no, there's not dragons in the Bible. And he said, oh, it is. And he said, book of Revelation. I went home that night and I read the book of Revelation. And there's some dragons there. I might not have understood what they meant. But the point is, I got the message. You know what the message is? God wins. In the end, you know, he wins. But there's a lot of things coming on the earth. It's not pleasant. And that's why the scripture says the day of the Lord is a day of darkness, a day of wrath. It's not a happy day. It's not a picnic. Things are coming. How could you ever straighten this world out? Tommy, if you were, if you were, you were the, the maximum power, what was you, how could you straighten this mess out? You know, it's going to take God, his wisdom, his might, his omnipotence. He's going to straighten things out. But you got to put down a lot of arrogant people and a lot of powerful people who love power and it's putting people down. With people being put down now, you know, if you look at world history, people have always suffered under uh, various tyrants, suffered terribly. The poverty of, of, of people in Europe, you know, different times, terrible thing under these rich and powerful people. And we have rich and powerful people today and they won't give up their throne. They have no intention of giving up their throne. In other words, one of the things that one of the commentators said that when you look at Nebuchadnezzar, and you'll see him, he's real proud. He brags on his own glory and honor and majesty, all the things he's done. God takes him down one inch at a time. And, and you, I want you to watch that when you're lesson. You'll see that. And so one of the commentators said, this shows you the character of, of the leaders of the world. The leaders of the world, the character is sort of like Nebuchadnezzar. They're proud. They, they, they take great pleasure in the things that they have done, the things they've built, the mechanisms, you know, the corporations, the banking system, whatever it is. And they're very, very powerful. They're not going to give it up. But, they, but people suffer under all this. And uh, the Lord knows. But you'll see, if you follow through, though, Nebuchadnezzar one day will know the Lord. He's going to know him. Right now, he doesn't. When, when he gets through this, when, he, when Daniel interprets for him, he's going to say, there's no God like Daniel's God. <clears throat> you know, he wants to worship. He, he bows down to Daniel. And, you know, has, uh, you know, makes all these declarations, but he doesn't accept him as his God. And so, but before it's over with, he learns something about God. There's three different stages about that. I think I put that in here. Uh, yeah, I did. At the bottom of the page, the second page, the very bottom, where it says the king's confession, uh, I put on here, this is another step in the king's progressive apprehension of the one true God. The first one was chapter 2, verse 47, then chapter 3, verse 28, and then chapter 4, verses 34 through 37. And you'll see, if you'll watch that progression, he gets to know God a little bit better each time, and he loses his arrogance. He loses his arrogance. You know, we learn from James that God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. And this man is going to be humbled before it's over with. You can watch it, see? And you can watch God do the same thing to world leaders. That's going to happen. Now, let's see what else we got. Yeah, the fifth kingdom. Uh, this is the last part of this. The fifth kingdom is God himself. And he establishes that through the coming of Jesus back to the earth. And this is the final phase of the fourth kingdom. In other words, the final phase. This is the, wrong, the fourth kingdom. This is the final phase right here where the Antichrist is right here. This is the Antichrist in here. And so... The kingdom of God is established in the final phase of the times of the Gentiles. It ends the times of the Gentiles. One more time. The times of the Gentiles began in 605 B.C. when Babylon took the land and dominated the Jews and it's continued all the way and will continue all the way until the second advent of Jesus Christ. All the people, talk, the Bible believers say that in their commentary. It started with Babylon in 605 
It goes all the way, the times of the Gentiles goes all the way to the time Jesus returns. Until then, the people of God, if we're talking about the Jews, and we are talking about the Jews, because prophecy doesn't talk about us. Prophecy talks about the Jews. And so they're going to get really beat up, persecuted. Now, one of the things I went through the quarterly today and looked at is when that little application part, and we ought to pray for the people who are being persecuted today, see, uh, in the body of Christ. The body of Christ is suffering today. And so we should remember those in all the world that are being persecuted, Christians. Uh, it's huge, huge persecution taking place now. We can expect the persecution here to be to intensify toward the end of the church age. But here we can expect it to in, intensify toward the Jew right here. Jesus said in Matthew 24, he says, the time is coming. He talked about, he said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken to you of, uh, of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place and then he talks about the judgment Take, he says get out of Jerusalem get away go because of the destruction that's going to come and he says that time will be more severe than any other time in world history so this is going to be the most severe time in world history this last three and a half years and he said Jesus said and if that day had not been shortened there would none of the elect would have been delivered or saved. And so he says, for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So we, we, we got three and a half years, but God may you know, intervene here and shorten these days a little bit in order to save the people from, their, from the destruction that's coming. Read this in Matthew 24. Okay, so the rock, that last part is a rock. I've already talked about it. There's your, all your scriptures. Isaiah 8, verse 14, Isaiah 28, 16, Zechariah 3, verse 9. There's all, you know, God is spoken of as the rock, as a symbol for God and for Jesus Christ in the scriptures. And so when it says there's a rock that's hewn out, not with man's hands, and then hits this statue here, that rock hits this thing, and it's gone. And so we know that that's what he's talking about. The Lord Jesus Christ coming again. All right, now the last part, and we're hurrying. I'm going to let you out on time. The last part is, <laughs> is part of what your lesson would be about. But you needed this background. The first part of this, I just put it out the outline. Number one, the image of gold. Now that's a different image. The image of gold. All right, so once, once Nebuchadnezzar gets all this in his brain, and he worships, you know, he, 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 you know, he says, there's no God like Daniel's God. We don't know the time frame now. When you go from one chapter to another, it could be years. You just don't know. There is, you know, he does give dates in there. You have to figure them out. But the point is, later on, he there's some time left that he built this 90-foot statue. Now, whether it was a himself or whatever it was, it was a it was a statue, and he required everyone to bow down to it and worship it. And you know, there's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego decide they're not going to bend they're not going to bow and turns out they didn't burn remember <laughs> remember that story they didn't bend they didn't bow they didn't burn and the old king you know he's you know when they say to him king when he calls them in and said now look you didn't bow but let me tell you when the music starts again all you have to do is bow down and they said sir we don't have to answer you we serve a god he can deliver us. He can deliver us from your power. But if he doesn't, you know, he's still the God of heaven. You know, he's still still our God. We're going to trust him all the way, whether he delivers us or he doesn't, you know. And so, again, that pictures God's people in tribulation that's coming. God's going to deliver his people over here. They're going to go through the fire. There's a lot of stuff they're going to go through. And God is going to deliver them. You say, well, he didn't deliver them under Hitler. That's right. Uh, Hitler took place right in here somewhere. He is not doing those things right now. He is not dealing with Israel like that. Now, they have blessing through Abraham. Their blessing through Abraham continues throughout human history. Meaning, they're not spiritual blessing. They're uh, human blood. They have intellect. They have skill. 
they are some of the Nobel Prize winners, you know, Abbott Einstein. He was an unbeliever. He died that way, as far as I know. But he had great intellect, and he, he offered something to humanity. And there's wealth there, too. So God has blessed the Jews to Abraham physically and spiritually, but their spiritual blessing comes through Jesus, the greater son of Abraham, the seed of Abraham. Until they come to him, they don't have a spiritual blessing, but they do have physical blessing, but also curses because of the, the nature of how Satan hates the Jew. And so if you go to chapter 12, of the book of Revelation, you'll see a dragon standing before a pregnant woman. And she's about to give birth to a man-child. Talking about, that's Jesus, see, right? And so and then it says, and, and God took that man-child up. He ascended up. And then it said, what does Satan do then? He turns on the woman. And the woman is Israel, not Mary. The woman is Israel. And so when does he turn on the woman? Right in here. He comes at them with fury to destroy them. Now, Satan's always wanted to destroy the Jew, period, under Hitler or whatever. There's anti-Semitism today. That's for sure. You know, you don't, be, you don't want to be a part of that. You, you just don't want to be a part of that. But, that, but you have to see, these are, that's one of the beautiful, beautiful things about knowing that God's word is true because of the Jew. The Jew is there. And that one, one person said that there's one evidence that the word of God is true, and that is the Jew, because of what's happened over the years. And I know they're back in the land today, but they're, they don't possess all the land, not even near what it should be, and they're not in control. The bankers are, and the corporations are, and a lot of other influences, the Nation, United Nations, and, and also the Muslims. <laughs> the Muslims has half of Jerusalem. And so and they're an atheism, you know, they're unbelievers. And they may not even be Jews for all we know. That's right, the, you know, there's Ethiopian Jews who, who've come to Israel now to live there. So we don't know, but God knows his people. And he's scattered them all over the world. And it's, it is, and this is a little side thing, at the second advent is when there's a resurrection that'll take place of all those Old Testament saints. They're scattered all over the world. The Old Testament saints, not every Jew is saved, but those who were saved, will be re they'll be re resurrected right here. The resurrection for this period of time, the church age, is the rapture right here. The resurrection for Old Testament saints is right here. The scripture says that over and over. The prophets talk about that. Okay, so I think that pretty well <laughs> might get it. You know, who is the who is the rock? Well, the rock. Nebuchadnezzar said, "There's th not, not. I mean, who is this in the fiery furnace? Three Hebrew children, but I see four. Four people are down, and one of them looks like a son of a son of a god, a son of God, a son of God, or an angel." One of the translators said, "Some. He, they look like he's an angel down there with them." And so most conservative scholars take that to mean the pre-incarnate presence of Jesus Christ. The pre-incarnate presence. And there was, there was times in the Old Testament that Jesus Christ actually appeared to Abraham and to others. And so the pre-incarnate presence of Christ in the furnace with them. And you got to think about that too, you know. <laughs> think about that, you know. Even if you raised up, is it Doris's daughter, whoever it was, she just died. If you could raise her up from the day, you've got something to work with. But if you throw three, three people into a fiery furnace, they done, the, the people that threw them in there fell back dead, you don't have anything to work with. You, you, you cremated everybody. And yet, they didn't even come out smelling of smoke. You know? All right, let's close for a prayer. Y'all have comments, anything? Uh, be great if you commented and enlightened us a little bit on what we're talking about. Uh, yeah, let me, let me say this. Let me read this for you real quick. This is Ironside. And here's what he said at the end. He says, I would remark in closing that while Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshiped Daniel, y'all remember that? 
he falls down and worships down. And acknowledge that his God, Daniel's God, was a God of gods, a Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets. Yet there is no evidence that his life, that his conscience had been reached by the revelation made to him of God's wisdom and of God's power. He advanced, he advanced Daniel to a position of trust and confidence. And at his request, he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the providence of Babylon. But the God of Daniel was not yet ready to own as his God. He was not ready to own Daniel's God as his God and the only, and the only Savior. He, meaning Nebuchadnezzar, was still to him just a God, a God, little g, albeit greater than other deities. He was soon to know, he was soon to know him as the God who alone ruleth in the kingdoms of men. I love that. And I gave you those scriptures where there is a progression where he comes to know. You know he goes mad and he's, he has to eat straw like an animal. They feed him like an animal for a while. But when he finally gets his senses back, he knows who God is. You know, maybe that's what we need. You know, when, I, when we come to ourselves, like the prodigal son says, when he came to himself, he said, I will arise and go to my father. And I will confess to my father that I've sinned against, against him, against heaven. No longer worthy to be your son. And the father throws his arms around him. This is my son who was dead. Now he lives. He was lost. Now he's found. God's grace is, he resists the proud, but it gives grace to the humble. And so that's part of it. You know, when people say, in our day, when we say, repent and believe, it does not mean, we, know, we do not mean repent of your sins. It, it, you, when are you going to repent of all your sins? And if you do, if that's necessary for your salvation, how long are you going to keep your salvation? How long are you going to keep If you can lose your salvation, how long are you going to keep it? You won't keep it a day. We don't lose our salvation. Salvation is of God. And we say repent, and God has commanded. It's a command. God has commanded every man to repent. Paul said that. It means turn away from your beliefs about who God is. You're not God. There is a God in heaven. And Nebuchadnezzar found that out. You know? And so we all need to find that out. You know? And then that you can really worship a God like that. You can humble yourself before the Lord. And uh, that's when true worship takes place. You can when you receive the revelation, and worship is always revelation and response. And if I can't receive the revelation, I don't have a response. And worship is a response to the revelation that God makes to you. That's what worship is. Okay. Okay. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You want to increase your faith? Hear the word of God more. Really. The more I spend in the Word, the more faith I have. The more I hear, I hear the Word, I breathe the Word, I study the Word, the more faith I get. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You want more faith? Quit struggling about it. Just get more Word. Get the Word of God in you. If you're saved, the Word of God will empower you and give you more faith. You'll have more faith. You'll be as bold as Daniel. Let's pray. Let's pray. Uh, Time to leave us in a prayer, please, Father. Father, thank you for your word and the power of your word. And Father, thank you for Brother Tommy and how he uh, he has studied and Father, you revealed uh, these truths to him. And I thank you for him revealing some of this to us. Father, thank you for our faith. And I thank you that it can be strengthened as we stay in your word. And I pray that that would be our supreme desire know you better to know the revelation of Christ and his glory and all that he has done for us we pray all of this in Christ's name Amen, Amen. Thank you Thank you, Thank you.